Today we're going to talk about longitudinal stability and mainly longitudinal static stability. We had a nice opening screen. If you see here the, all the pictures, my, my assistant warned me explicitly that he thought this was photoshopped. Well, probably yes. Um, this, this lecture he also asked me to warn you that this, this lecture is one of the harder ones um, because we will not only look at longitudinal static stability in a qualitative way, but also in a quantitative way. So after this lecture, you should be able to calculate yourself the position, size uh, of, the, of the tail, of the, the, the wing surface, the center of gravity, to make sure that the aircraft is longitudinally statically stable. You may have seen different uh, configurations in terms of the, the tail of, of aircraft. Yeah, there are, there have been, you, you probably saw the T-tail or the tail which was mounted to the fuselage. Uh, even more exotic like twin tails or V-tails. And um, wh why is this and what is the effect of, of such, uh, such choices? And moreover, if you look at the total uh, configuration of the aircraft, there are aircraft which have a, the, the standard configuration, like, like the, the, the normal aft tail. But you may have also seen a few which have a, a canard, so have a, a front tail and the wing aft. And their free surface aircraft, uh, Piaggio for instance, tandem wing, even some experimental design, tailless, flying wings. And there are, there are many reasons to go for one configuration or the other, and many have to do with stability. And of course, for any configuration, you have to assure there's some level of longitudinal static stability. And therefore, we first have to look at what longitudinal static stability really means. So let's look at this, this aircraft flying in the cruise, which suddenly experiences a, a airflow upwards, turbulence, and there's an increase of angle of attack, the nose, goes up, then for a stable aircraft, for this positive delta alpha, we want a change in pitching moment, which brings the nose down again. So that's a negative pitching moment. And in this case, I've written the pitching moment coefficient to make sure that it's unitless and it works for all speeds and all altitudes. So the pitching moment as a reaction to a positive delta alpha, the pitching moment should experience a change in the negative direction. In, in the, the, the same goes if we go to the uh, nose down example, for instance, we want a, uh, for, so for negative delta alpha, we want a positive pitching moment. In other words, the uh, change should be, have a different sign in, in pitching moment than the change in angle of attack. And this we can also write is in, in this way, let's say that the delta cm divided by delta alpha should be smaller than zero. And if we look at this for very small deviations, we write this with a normal d instead of the delta. So we say the small changes in uh, pitching moment divided by the small changes in angle of attack should be less than zero. And this d cm d alpha is sometimes for shorthand also written as the CM alpha. So it's the derivative of the pitching moment due to the angle of attack. And this is nothing else than dividing the change in pitching moment by the change in angle of attack. This is one of the three things you have to know be before we can start the actual derivation of uh, how we can make an aircraft longitudinal statically stable. The second thing you have to know is what happens at the tail surface of an aircraft. So if we look at, the, uh, at, the, at a tail of a, of a regular aircraft, if we see it here, then you, uh, we can draw this more schematically by looking at the two wings here. We have the main wing in the front and we have the tail surface to the back. And often you, there is a little trim setting uh, which causes the elevator to have, to have a slightly upward direction, the tail surface to have a slightly upward direction. And this, this uh, incidence, this angle of incidence of the horizontal tail is called IH. So it's a tail surface setting set with the trim wheel by the pilot. And during our disturbance, during our turbulence, this doesn't change. This is a constant. It is set by the pilot only to balance the forces to make sure that the total moment around the center of gravity is zero in the equilibrium so that the aircraft will continue to fly at the same pitching angle, at the same angle of attack. 
If we then look at the angle of attack at the wing, this is the angle between the body axis and the speed, you might think that it's the same at the tail except for this angle of incidence. But this is not true. The wing generates a lot of lift and this lift force is if you zoom out, of course it's created by pressure of the distribution over the, over the wing, but if you zoom out, the net effect is also that air is pushed down by the shape of this wing and by its angle of attack. And that means that the angle of attack at the tail is actually slightly less. The air is bent downwards a little and this means that there is a different angle of attack at the tail. Of course it can be increased again with this angle of incidence, the, the tail surface setting, but uh, there's also a downwash which decreases it compared to the angle of attack and this we uh, normally uh, write as epsilon, the downwash angle. If we write this mathematically, we can write this, uh, this sum, which says the angle of attack of the horizontal tail surface is equal to the angle of attack of the whole aircraft, of the wing, plus the tail surface setting, the angle of incidence of the horizontal tail, but minus the downwash. And later we will also want to see what the effect is of a change of angle of attack. And if the angle of attack suddenly changes, how will the horizontal uh, tail, tail surface angle of attack change? Well, we can derive this equation 2 alpha and the, then we get this equation, the derivative of the uh, uh, tail angle of attack to the normal angle of attack is just the derivative of this equation. Well, the alpha becomes 1, the d d alpha of alpha is 1. The i h is, uh, is a constant, it doesn't change due to alpha, so it becomes a 0. And the downwash might change to angle of attack, so we simply write the change of downwash angle due to a change of angle of attack there, the d epsilon d alpha. In other words, the d alpha h d alpha is 1 minus d epsilon d alpha. And this is for now just a mathematical thing, what happens what is when the angle of attack changes, but this is something we will use later when we look at the disturbance of the equilibrium. The third thing you have to know is a definition and that's what we will use and that there is one location for every surface, every wing surface, which is called the aerodynamic center. And it's the aerodynamic center is the position where the moment generated by all the aerodynamic forces around the airfoil, the moment does not change due to the angle of attack. So when there's a change in angle of attack, of course the, the lift will increase, but the moment will stay the same. Be aware this is not the same position as where if you would sum all the forces where the resulting force would be uh, uh, pulling on this wing, because it's, it's specifically chosen for this reason of the moment, the moment that doesn't change and uh, due to an angle of attack. So if we get an extra angle of attack, the moment stays the same, but there will be an extra lift force. This we call the aerodynamic center and that's very useful for, for our calculations. And uh, you have to write, you cannot write a simple force then instead of the wing, we have to write a force and a moment, but this is the moment around the aerodynamic center and it will be constant for all angles of attack. So these are the, the three things which we will use in the derivation of our relation for the longitudinal static stability. So here we see schematically the same picture as we saw earlier on the situation on the, in the tail in the, in the lecture. We have a, uh, a wing with a lift of the wing body, the, so everything of the aircraft without the tail. And then a bit further to the right we have a little tail surface with LH indicating the lift of the horizontal tail. In the middle we have the center of gravity, CG, where the weight applies. And we have some dimensions indicated, LCG is the distance between the aerodynamic center of the wing and the center of gravity, and LH is the distance between the aerodynamic center of the wing and the aerodynamic center of the tail surface. We also have a moment in the wing indicated in orange, the moment around the aerodynamic center, 
Remember, it doesn't change with the angle of attack, but it's also larger than, than zero. Actually, it's, it's smaller than zero, but it's indicated here larger than zero because we will, for our signs, we will always use this direction, nose up, as positive, and this is how we draw the moments. In reality, when there's positive lift, there is a, a, a negative moment. So MAC, as we have drawn it now, will be smaller than zero. But this is the direction which we use for all moments, and that's also how I draw it. So this is the total situation of this, uh, this aircraft. And let's first look at, at uh, equilibrium forces. And this shows that if we look at the total forces up and down, that uh, down we have the weight, and up we have the lift of the wing body, plus the lift of the horizontal tail surface. And this is in total the lift of the complete aircraft. So there, if, those, if these conditions are met, then we have a, uh, a horizontal or uh, vertical forces uh, equilibrium. And this is normally done by changing the angle of attack of the wing so that this total uh, equation uh, holds and that we are keeping our altitude. For the moment, we can do the same. We can write the total uh, moment equation, which, is, which also has to be zero. So if we say the total of the moments, well, this has to be an M, total has to be zero. Let's see what it, uh, what it is. It is, uh, well, first of all, the moment around the aerodynamic center. And we can, because there's equilibrium of forces, we can also place this to the center of gravity. So if we look at the uh, uh, moment around the center of gravity, we can just use the moment around the aerodynamic center as if it was around the center of gravity, because there's an equilibrium of forces in the vertical direction. We can just displace the moment and doesn't change, the number doesn't change. And then, in the positive direction, we also have the lift of the wing body times the arm. And we take the moment around the center of gravity, so it's LCG is the arm. And then, resulting in a negative moment, we have the lift of the horizontal tail times, and this is not just LH, but LH minus LCG, because that's the arm of this force, and that's this part of the, this, this side of the aircraft. So this is the total uh, moment around the, uh, the center of gravity, and we can simplify this slightly. So MAC remains MAC, but by taking away the brackets, LVB times LCG minus LH times small LH plus LH times LCG, the two minuses become a plus. Then we can see that these two are both multiplied with LCG, so we can also write this as MAC plus the lift of the wing body plus the lift of the horizontal tail times LCG minus the lift of the horizontal tail times little LH. We've seen that this, from our equation here, that this is the same as the total lift. So let's write this as the total lift, and then we get our moment equation plus the lift times LCG minus LH times LH, and this has to be zero to avoid the aircraft rotating. So we have adjusted the L to match the vertical force uh, equilibrium. What we normally do then is to change the angle of incidence of the horizontal tail, so this angle, to make sure that we have a, a lift of the horizontal tail surface, which will make this moment zero, and this is what we call trimming the aircraft. So now we have an equilibrium of forces, an equilibrium of moments, and we have these equations which we, uh, which we can use, and especially this lower one is one that we can also use to, to then look at the stability. So what happens if there is a disturbance of this peaceful equilibrium while we are flying in our cruise flight? 
Well, we saw in, our, in the previous slide that therefore we use the moment uh, coefficient. So let's first make this complete, uh, this, com this complete equation for the total moment. Let's include that one. So let's use this total equation and make it unitless or dimensionless. So we know that the moment coefficient, Cm, is the moment divided by half rho v squared s times the average chord, which is the distance between the front leading edge and the aft leading edge of the wing, the average. Sometimes I write a little line above it because it's the average chord, but often I leave it out as well, I just write the C of chord. We have to remember it's the average chord, it's basically the span uh, of the wing area divided by the span that gives you the, uh, the average chord. So by dividing the moment by half rho v squared sc, we get the moment coefficient. And uh, this also goes for our equation, so let's, uh, let's fill our equation in and divide every part by half rho s squared. So we had the moment around the aerodynamic center. This has to be divided by half rho v squared sc. We also had our lift, it's a positive contributing lift times LCG has to be divided by half rho v squared SC and also our negative contribution to the moment divided by half rho v squared SC. Well, let's see what we, what we have as a result. We have MAC, this is nothing else than the aerodynamic center moment coefficient. And here we see that this coefficient we know. L divided by half rho v squared s, that is of course the CL of the aircraft. And what we are left over with is LCG divided by C, sort of unitless distance. And then here, well this is slightly more complex, we cannot easily do the same trick because LH is CLH, is the lift coefficient as given for this surface, but of course this was calculated for this specific area, so it's half rho v squared SH. So we have to write this here, CLH times half rho v squared s h times l h and that has to be divided by half rho v squared s c. And we see that some things cancel out there, easily the half rho v squared, but not the s or the c. So what we're left over with is this part of the equation and this we give a specific name because we have to write this a lot of time, we call this the tail volume, VH. It's a volume because it's a surface area times a length, but it's not a real volume, it's the, the surface area of the horizontal tail times the arm of the horizontal tail divided by SC of the, of the wing. But it gives our total equation and makes it much more readable by using all these coefficients. It's C M A C plus C L times L C G over C minus C L H times the tail volume V H. And this is basically the same equation as we've written on the previous slide. It's the one we had below here. The total moment and lift. But now everything is made unitless, dimensionless, in coefficients. But in essence it says the same thing. 
Now, what we said that for stability, this moment, uh, this, this change in moment coefficient due to a change in angle of attack, had to be negative. It had to, the, the two things had to be uh, uh, have to have an opposite sign: the change in moment and change in angle of attack. So the DCM, the alpha, had to be negative. So we will use this equation to calculate the derivative of it due to alpha. So we have this equation, Cm is Cm aerodynamic center plus Cl times Lcg over C minus Clh times Vh. And then we have to calculate the derivative to alpha. So to get the dcm d alpha, because that's apparently our parameter which has to be negative for longitudinal static stability. Well, the first thing we do, we have to derive the moment coefficient in the aerodynamic center due to alpha. Well, the derivative to alpha means the change due to change in alpha. Well, the definition for aerodynamic center was that this was zero. It's constant for all angles of attack, so the derivative to alpha is zero. Here, for the lift, this is not true. If we change the, uh, the angle of attack, the lift coefficient will increase. So it will be dCl d alpha for now. LCG, the dimensions of the aircraft do not change due to an angle of attack. So this is just a constant with which we multiply. And here we have to write the change in lift coefficient of the tail surface due to change of angle of attack. And VH is again the dimensions of the aircraft will remain constant. So we are nearly there. These, uh, these coefficients, this is easily obtained, the DCL, the alpha. You will just go to your aerodynamics guy and he will give you the lift curve. And he will say, okay, the, normally you're flying in this region where CL due to alpha change in a linear fashion. And you will just have to use the steepness which we often call A. A is simply the DCL, the alpha, but then the constant part. The A, you will, uh, he will give you this number for the airfoil and you can just use it. So you can say, uh, the, we can write this CM alpha is the same thing as DCM, the alpha. So we can leave out the zero and we say basically A times LCG divided by C. And this is just a figure the, your aerodynamics people can give you for your specific uh, airfoil. Well, the same of course is true for the horizontal tail. They will also give it to you for the horizontal tail, but they will then give it to you for the angle of attack of the horizontal tail. And then you will get the A of the tail, the AT. But now there's a problem because we can get this number, but we need a different number, we need the DCL, the alpha. Well, we, what we can do, of course, is say we can multiply the DCL, the alpha, by the alpha H divided by the alpha H, because that's one. The change of itself due to itself is always one. It's also, if you look at it in deltas, it's the, the denominator and the low part of the fraction is the same. So it's multiplied by one. This we can also write as DCL D alpha H is times, oh not this, times D alpha H D alpha. And this we know, we've calculated this before. This was one minus D epsilon the alpha, and this is simply the AT, the steepness of the curve for the tail. In other words, we can write this as the AT times 1 minus the epsilon the alpha times VH. And that's this trick. But just going, but just multiplying it by one and then writing it in a different way.
it's also this this way by the way you might also recognize as the the, the chain rule for for derivation so here we have the cm alpha and this had to be smaller than zero it had to be negative for a uh, for stability so let's see what uh, what this means this means that if we move this to the other side you basically say that the a LCG divided by C has to be smaller than the AT 1 minus the epsilon the alpha times VH. What we've done here, we've moved this part to the other side of the equation. You could also say that when this is smaller, because they're all positive numbers, if this is smaller than this part, then the total result will be negative. And if we then divide by A on the left and right side, we get our... Well, this just doesn't do what I expected it to do. So like this. We divide by A on the left and the right side, and then we get this equation. I'm going to write it here. We get then here AT divided by A, and this is the total definition of longitudinal static stability, that the center of uh, gravity, the length uh, between the distance between the aerodynamic center and center of gravity divided by the chord has to be smaller than this equation. These are all numbers you can get for a specific choice of uh, of uh, airfoils for your surfaces. And here, in, in, in this side of the equation, this VH is basically a design parameter. Remember, this was SH times LH divided by SC, the tail volume. And this is basically your aircraft configuration in one number. Uh, if you choose a certain distance to the tail or a certain size of your tail, this will influence this VH and therefore influence your stability. And this whole side of the equation, if your center of gravity is equal to this, so if we have it equal, then we call the center of gravity position, we call this a neutral point. So the neutral point means it's equal to this and because then the CM alpha is zero, and it means there's neutral static stability. You can therefore also say that the uh, center of gravity has to be before the neutral point, because it has to be smaller. This distance has to be uh, small, so this center of gravity, let's see this, this distance has to be small, so the center of gravity has to move in this direction to make it more stable, it might even be negative. The more forward, more stable it is. And there is a position here, the neutral point, on which you're on the verge of instability, and if you go in the other direction, you will be unstable with your center of gravity if you move it here. And therefore, the distance between your actual center of gravity and the neutral point is your margin, and this is called your static margin. And it shows the margin you still have in the, in the aircraft. So if you're ever in an aircraft and the captain says, oh, we've done something wrong with our weight and balance, and we're approaching, we're nearly unstable, it's best to all run to the front of the aircraft to move the center of gravity forward and ensure stability. So we have derived this first equation here, the center, the, the, uh, the position of the center of gravity and how it influences the CM alpha. And you see here the, the result of our equation. And we've also said that if, you're, if you want to be statically stable, then CM alpha has to be zero. So then we get this neutral point the center of gravity is then in the neutral point, and normally we want the CM alpha to be uh, less than zero, which means that the uh, center of gravity, or the LCG, this arm, has to be less, less. So in other words, the center of gravity has always 
to has always to move forward for uh, more stability. It has to be before the neutral point. And the distance between these uh, two positions is what we call the static margin. It's the distance between the center of gravity where it actually is and the position where it should be in case of neutral stability. So as long as we have a positive static margin, we have a positive aircraft. As soon as we get our center of gravity beyond the neutral point, then uh, we will get an unstable situation. Well, this is uh, of course true for a conventional configuration uh, like, like we have here. But of course there are also aircraft which have a less conventional configuration, for instance the Canard. And uh, the, the, the Canard aircraft has it reversed. And of course a nice question now would be, how does this work for this type of aircraft? And this will be a, a, a nice thing to try at home, to do the same thing that I just did. Maybe you have to watch it another time or uh, maybe once or twice to, uh, to uh, see what we really did, the steps that we did there. But to summarize it, the idea is that you first make your moment equation for this aircraft. Now we have a lift of the canard here and we have the lift of the wing body there, so on the aft side. And then you uh, have to... Uh, Der derive the, the, the first make it dimensionless, unitless, and then derive it to the angle of attack. And then you have, again, you have to say the CM alpha has to be negative, because also for Canard, you want the effect that the reaction to a positive deviation alpha is a negative moment coefficient. So that stays the same. But of course, some, some dimensions are different. And um, one thing that is different is that in a way the Canard is easier because you, you can ignore the downwash of the canard surface on the wing. And there are a number of reasons for this. One is that the, the canard is very small, and the other one is that it's a symmetrical airfoil in general, which is also the reason why we did not have a moment around the aerodynamic center of the tail surface or canard surface. It's a symmetrical airfoil, and therefore it will not generate a lot of lift, and it will not have a lot of downwash, because downwash was the result of lift. And the downwash of this wing clearly does not affect the canard surface. So it's in a way it's even easier. But try it and see what the criteria are for the center of gravity location for a canard aircraft. Good luck with that. <laughs>